Hi, everyone. I'm David Williams, president of strategy consulting firm Health Business Group and host of the Health Biz Podcast, a weekly show where I interview top healthcare entrepreneurs about their lives and careers. If you enjoy this episode, I hope you'll hit that like button and subscribe to the Health Biz Podcast. My guest today is Sean Blackburn. He is co-founder and CEO of Y-Prime, which is a technology company that helps simplify the management of clinical trials for the life sciences industry. Sean, thanks for joining me today. It's great to be here, David. So, Sean, we're going to talk a lot about uh, Y Prime, but also want to talk about what has led up to that uh, for you. And if you don't mind, maybe we'll just start with your uh, with your upbringing. What was your childhood like? Any uh, any influences that have sort of stuck with you for the long term? You know, we moved around a lot as a uh, when growing up. So, I was born in California. Uh, moved to Louisiana when I was five. We spent a year in Minnesota, and then I moved to the <clears throat> Philadelphia suburbs when I was 18. So I got to see all you know all corners of the country, and I think that had a big influence on my upbringing, uh, being adaptable, uh, being curious, and those types of things. So um, parents weren't in the military. My dad was a PhD biochemist, so usually people think I'm a military yeah. uh, brat. And not not me. I'm a biochemist brat. No, that's cool. Well, you did sort of like the reverse migration. You know, they say in California, everybody's from somewhere else. But in, you know, I guess they say in uh, in Minnesota or, or Philadelphia, Louisiana, everybody's from yeah. California. So that's the... Yeah, I got the wrong end of the stick, I think. <laughs> yeah. Now, just a little tip for your parents for next uh, next time they're raising kids. I grew up in Bethesda, Maryland, and most people could just stick around there if they were doing uh, if they were doing science. Yeah, Exactly. Anyway, no, that's great. And I think actually I, I have heard from multiple people, some military brats and some not, that sort of that adaptability, uh, you know, as a kid moving around, having to make friends, reach out, can adapt to new environments and see different perspectives and helpful uh, as an entrepreneur, uh, at least. So you're not the first one to tell me that. Yeah, I, mean, I think I went to 10 different schools before I graduated high school. Wow. Yeah. That's pretty good. That's, uh, that's, that's pretty good. So, uh, so have you done that with your own kids? Now, actually, it's funny, but my wife and I talk about that because she also went to a number of schools around the greater New York City area growing up. And we both feel, um, you know, that it, it presents a, a healthy challenge for them, um, but not something they can't overcome. So it's something we think about and talk about, but we haven't haven't done that yet. Yeah, no, fair enough. Well, good. So uh, talk about your, you know, early career, because I know, you know, you didn't necessarily start off with uh, kind of clinical trial technologies and stuff like that. In fact, something more down to earth. Down to earth landscaping was a business I started in my 20s. And prior to that, I uh, had worked for different construction companies. I did just about every job you could do in building houses. And so about, uh, I think when I turned 25, I uh, started my own uh, landscape design and installation company, so doing walls and patios and everything outside. Loved working outside with my hands, but by the time I was 29, I'm a, I'm a tall tall guy, I'm six foot six. Yeah. I, I felt my body was not going to withstand another 10, 20 years of, of that industry and decided to go back into uh, software programming. Very nice. Now, I saw once you did that, you start to be involved with a couple companies that I'm more familiar with, like Perceptive Informatics, Cephalon. Yeah. What what were those experiences like? Uh, those were uh, great for me because I started at a company called Fraser Williams, which was bought by Parkzell Perceptive Informatics, and it was a clinical trial management software. And it was a great starting point to jump in the clinical trial industry because you kind of see all sides of it, but you really don't know anything. And so, and you're working on the vendor side, not necessarily the sponsor side. Um, so I had a, a good foundation of kind of understanding uh, the lingo, the language, kind of the end-to-end -end process. Uh, but it wasn't until I went to Cephalon that I realized I knew nothing about running <laughs> clinical trials. And everything I thought I knew that was important really wasn't that critical. Uh, once you get on the inside, uh, working with the sponsor, working hand in hand with all the different departments, then you realize uh, how clinical trials are run. I guess the thing is with um, 
you know, it's interesting though, starting off on kind of the software side, because anything you're doing in software, it has to be pretty structured. You can't give the computer in general, you know, sort of vague instructions and let it do what's what. So you, you did have a good idea, at least of the, like the whole process and probably, you know, where maybe without understanding why, but where there would be hang ups, where things would happen that were, that were wrong and the challenges of departments communicating with one another. You run, um, yeah, I mean, the, the software side, you really understand the data elements, right? And how the data yeah. moves back and forth. But just like any business, it's driven by people. And I think that was really the big learning experience for us, um, both myself and the other co-founder, Y Prime, both had kind of the same um, career path working for Perceptive, then Cephalon, and then we co-founded Y Prime together. That's great. So how did you develop a kind of a leadership philosophy, you know, along the way there? Some of the things, even as we stuck, talked about from the kind of the childhood going through different schools and then in landscaping and construction and so on there, you know, I'm sure there's some things that were, that were there, but how did it all kind of come together before you're ready to actually lead a company? You know, I don't know if there was particular, you know, I never really focused on, I have to be a great leader per se. Um, I do know I had early employers that would say, you need to be your own boss because you clearly never listen to my instructions. You just want to do what <laughs> you always think you know what's best and you want to do what you want to do. Um, and, and I wasn't being arrogant. I just had lots of ideas and, and intellectual curiosity. So I, I, I read, you know, 100, 200 business books uh, once we started Y Prime because I really didn't want to mess it up. Yeah. And so I was I was always, I think it goes back to my childhood and being adaptable is probably a very um, important leadership trait. I always think empathy is the most important one because you have to look at uh, conflicting sides of just about every story that's brought to you as a leader. There's always two sides and yeah. you want to make sure you don't think you don't take anything out of context. And so I think that that was probably what the early things I had to, you know, really focus on. And, and that's what I still use today, really. Well, it sounds like, you know, you had, I, I don't know if it was meant as, as a compliment or not, but when people said you need to be your own boss, it's, that's a good advice, you know, for somebody that is actually has those kind of characteristics, because you could see, uh, you know, they were, they were giving you sound, um, sound direction. I know it is yeah. helpful to, you know, to do something that, that, that fits with your personality. When my oldest son became a, a hockey referee in high school. And my wife and I said, that's, that's great. He doesn't listen to grownups anyway, so he won't be phased by coaches and fans, you know, yelling at him. And sure enough, didn't bother him. So, there you go. <laughs> so we'll see where, it, yeah. And he's actually doing software development now. So we'll see where that, uh, where that takes him. So for Y Prime itself, well, you know, what's the origin of the company? I mean, obviously you had the background, you had the insight, both from the, maybe the software vendor side and then the sponsor side. So it's not like, you know, why did you found a, a company like this? But how, how did it come about that you said you needed, there should be a new company and you should run it? So we had an opportunity to, to continue working at Cephalon um, and supporting all of the things that we had built there from 2003 to 2006. And then I, I actually our former employer, Perceptive, also had a number of projects that they could use our, myself and, and my co-founder Jamie's uh, skill sets on. And so our original plan, we were just going to be consultants. We were going to be a two person company and we were going to work 80 hours a week for the rest of our days and, you know, be online all the time. Um, that was it. That was our plan. So there wasn't much to it. I, I always encourage people, if you have a way to, if you're interested in starting your own company, uh, consulting, contracting is a, is a quick way to get things started. Um, and there and where you take it from there is really up to you. Yeah, no, that's great. So um, then what happened in terms of how you did decide to grow it beyond just kind of working yourself to the bone, which you'd first done in the landscaping side and construction, and then we're doing on the software side too. So I, I do see a theme emerging here. Uh, but where yeah. did you take where did you take it to help to, you know, to scale beyond just the, the two guys that were starting it off? So in the early days, um, you know, we we maximized the relationships we had built at both Cephalon and, and Perceptive. And once people found out we had a company and they could hire us directly, uh, they were interested in, in um, us helping them because they all had similar business problems of getting 
data from A to B and, and getting extracts out and building reports and doing things repetitively and consistently. And so we realized we had to hire people um, because the two of the 80 hours a week philosophy was, wasn't going to work. Yeah. You know, three, three, four months into it, it was like, well, that's not going to work. So let's hire somebody. And by the end of the first year, I think we had eight or nine employees. We were like, wow, this is kind of interesting. This could be a lifestyle, you know, business, you know, company that we yeah. could run a little boutique consulting shop or something, you know, and, um, and that was the gist of it for about four, four or five years. Um, I think 2010, 2011 timeframe, uh, we started being asked to build software point solutions. So very specific applications to do one thing, uh, not very uh, complex, not a lot of logic or anything like that, but it got our, you know, got our feet wet. And then in 2011, we got asked to build a much bigger software uh, programs. And that's really when we, we started down the path of becoming a product company. And, you know, I always like to say we were just dumb enough to try things and, and venture into opportunities that we, if we were a little smarter, we would analyze it and said, this is too much risk. Yeah. Uh, but at the same time, we were just smart enough to figure it out too. So we, we've always had that, uh, Yin and yang, however we look at problems, we have myself who's very good at uh, starting with a, an empty whiteboard and, and the other co-founder is great when he has a list, the whiteboard filled out and has everything to do. And so we worked really well together and we built a, a team you know, and a family around Y Prime uh, that operated the same way. So there's obviously a lot of players you know, in the kind of ecosystem of, of clinical trials. Can you help me and help the listeners understand like, where do you fit into the ecosystem? Who are you serving? Who do you compete with? How do you, how do you fit in and make that a harmonious arrangement? It's a very unique industry. You obviously know the industry pretty well. Um, our end user is not necessarily our customer. And so when you think about the ecosystem uh, for, a, for reporting, uh, re reporting outcomes or assessments, it's either going to be done by a clinician or a patient or a caregiver. Um, and so we have to build our software to, to support them. But then the buyer of the software is, is the pharma company, the sponsor of the clinical trial. And, and they have many business needs for the software too. So that means it has to be a pretty broad platform to support the people operating the clinical trial as well as the people inputting the data. And so we, we are stewards of, of data collection, and then we must appropriately uh, integrate that data with other systems in the ecosystem and get that back in the hands of the decision makers so they can run these projects effectively. You know, sometimes companies, they specialize according to the size of the sponsor or the phase of a clinical trial or therapeutic area. Do you fit into one of those places or would there be sort of all different kinds of uh, customers that you would have? We have typically supported all kinds uh, of customers and all kinds of opportunities. And certainly there are some areas where you see companies with a lot of medical background in a particular therapeutic area make sense for them to stay, you know, more vertically focused. Uh, we came at it really from the data side and the data collection side. Uh, so pretty broad capabilities and supports many different types of needs. There's some big players in the space and there's been a lot of, you know, private equity activity to do some roll ups and, and so on. Um, and you're, you've you know, grown a lot, but I think you're probably not at the same scale as, as a couple of the players that I'm, I'm thinking about. How do you fit in there? Is it difficult to, you know, to be able to uh, compete in that type of environment or do you not see them head to head? Your, your customers, are your customers and then whatever else is going on, you know, is up to them. Um, no, I think we all see each other. I mean, everybody kind of knows each other. It's always said it's a, a bit of an incestuous industry. People move around uh, from our, you know, our, our gain is somebody else's loss. Our loss is somebody else's gain when it comes to employees and projects. Um, we're kind of in that middle, middle range at this time, um, but that means we're a lot more agile. And I always feel like the bigger companies wish they could operate like Y Prime does and, and be more flexible and agile. So we don't want to lose that either yeah. as we continue grow and you know our goal is our goal is to be as big as as they are their goal is to be as agile as we are um, right and that's the way it's probably always going to be yeah 
Well, I hope not. I hope you get to be big. I hope you achieve your goal, you know? <laughs> well, I mean, I, think we'll, I didn't mean we wouldn't grow. I'm just saying, I'm meaning that we will stay agile and, you know, we'll continue to focus got on the, cult, the culture that got us here and kind of the same attitude towards uh, delivering great, you know, customer service. So, you know, things changed quite a bit, obviously, in, uh, in 2020 um, with the clinical trials, uh, with sites not being able to be opened, uh, shift to decentralized trials, trials just being stopped and so on. What was Y Prime's uh, experience, uh, you know, over the past couple of years? Was it a, just a, did you notice like a total shift? Like it's just a disconnect between one era and the next or, you know, how, how did it go? Uh, so we, I remember distinctly March, I think it was Friday the 13th of, yeah. of March of 2020, you know, had the all staff call said, Hey guys, take your stuff home. If you're at the office today, yeah. I see in about two weeks. You know, right. two weeks later, they probably see it two weeks. And you go into our offices now and it looks like um, basically the rapture happened because there's desks where the calendars still say March yeah. of 2020. Um, but we really didn't miss a beat with our clients. Um, you know, pro as a software company, tech companies, probably most of them, I would say, just, you know, we start Monday, we're starting work from home. Yeah. I think we do some of the camaraderie. Um, a lot of people have started Y Prime, and I, I, I thank them uh, endlessly for for taking a, a chance on us in, in the new kind of world order of never really getting to meet your coworkers uh, yeah. face to face as much. So um, I think it's okay for us now. For our clients, it was a big challenge in the very beginning. You know, the first three months, sites were slow to get back up and running. Uh, but they got up there, and, and what we did is we provided a, a lot of um, enhanced features uh, on the ecosystem to allow that interaction remotely uh, for patients to fill out forms or uh, questionnaires or assessments that they might have had to do face-to-face -face with uh, the clinician before. Uh, we set it up so they could do those remotely during those early days. Yeah, there have been um, a fair number of companies that would be in the so-called decentralized trial space. So one of those that I interviewed recently, uh, Science37, would be an example. Do you put yourself in the sort of decentralized trials space or you're an enabler of any kind of a trial or how would you yeah. think about that overlap? We look at it a little differently with our we, and being around for 16 years now. We've seen a lot. Um, we consider ourselves collecting the meat and potatoes of, of clinical trial data and, you know, kind of look at the DCT world as convenience technologies and the convenience technologies are important, right? For user experience, for the, for the client experience, the patient experience, the site experience. Uh, we want to continue to innovate and do things that just make more sense. But at the heart of a clinical trial is the integrity of the data. And so that's where our focus is, has, has started and that's where we remain and that's how we look at ourselves a, a lot differently than the dct players that you see in the market that are coming more from this silicon valley technology will solve all your problems which we don't believe at all we believe uh, technology is an enabler uh, for people to operate in a new paradigm and and that's what we're looking to help people with and so we are now offering uh, we are now adding to our platform in Q4, uh, e-consent, uh, more patient engagement technologies. We acquired uh, um, a company with a patent on uh, patient engagement, it, really using things that they had learned from customer engagement world, from professional sports, uh, from resorts, and, and trying to blend that into a clinical trial, which is still a medical um, you know, project. It's not, you know, it's not a B2C world. It is a B2B world and it is a very highly regulated uh, type of uh, interaction that we're, we're helping solve. You know, in the first part of this interview, we talked a lot about kind of early days, what you learned about your kind of leadership philosophy, where you were going to get started and reading a bunch of books and not screwing it up. You've been running the company for, for a while now. Are there any sort of key things you'd say you'd, you know, you've learned, like advice to younger self or people that might be in a, in a similar position, any kind of broader takeaways? I think the number one thing I have learned that I coach my 
uh, executives on, at least the younger ones. We have a lot of executives on the team that don't need any coaching from me. They're, yeah. I get, I, I get coaching. But the ones that are up and coming, I always tell them, you know, trust your gut instincts. Most people are pretty good at reading uh, business situations, but most people are afraid, you know, don't have that courage to say, hey, this doesn't feel right. Somebody should say something. Yeah. How many times have you been on a call, a conference call, when somebody asks that question that everybody wants somebody to ask, but nobody yeah. wants to ask? Like everybody's thinking the same thing, just needs somebody to say it. And everybody's like, thank God somebody said it. Yeah. That, that's probably the number one thing I try and remind myself is if I'm thinking it, it's probably some other people thinking it. We should say it and, and yeah. do the do the right thing about it or at least talk through it. Um, there's countless other things that yeah. I probably use day in and day out, but that one's always the one that, that rises to the top for me is really trust your instincts. Um, you know, the people that are moving their careers successfully, you didn't do that by chance. You, right. You've got some good instincts, so keep trusting them. I think one of the things that's, that's different, uh, you know, after you've been at it for a while, you, you learn to trust your gut, but then it's also... You know, you formulate the question and people say, thank goodness somebody asked it. But it's also, did you formulate that question in the right way? So did you actually kind of pull it together and, and ask it the right way? And also in a way, sometimes people are worried about they're going to offend somebody or whatever. And they could, depending on how they frame it. So I think there's also something beyond kind of the instinct and the gut to then, what do I do with that to be, the, to be that? So the people have the reaction, yes, that's what I wanted to know. That's what I wanted to ask. So I'm putting words in your mouth, I know. No, no, we um, we do a lot of work, a lot of work around the psychology of, of the workplace and how there are uh, many different styles of communicators. And what I might say to you, David, the guy that hosts a podcast, clearly uh, you can be extroverted when you want to. I don't know if that's how you uh, recharge is, is by being extroverted, but you, you clearly know how to communicate. So I can probably communicate with you more effectively than somebody's maybe more of a software developer, more introverted more analytical that needs time to process. Um, and you kind of look at the different, you know, core types of personalities. There's, there's about four major ones and then lots of minor variances of that. And so you have to hit on people that are quick decision makers. You have to hit on people that want to talk through problems versus write them down. You got to hit on people that care how this impacts everybody. And you got to give the analytical people enough time to process uh, uh, business decisions or questions so it's fair to them to, to contribute equally. And that's hard to do in the fast paced world of business because you just want to communicate with your style and, and yeah. make things happen. And so probably the other thing I learned early from a, a mentor was Sean. She would say, Sean, typically you've been thinking about a problem for weeks, if not longer. And so when you go to your, your team and present you know, the ideas and potentially a solution, they've thought about it for zero days you need to give them a, a good amount of time to get caught up. So patience is in tempo. I have a board member and that's his kind of key word to me is like tempo, slow down, tempo. Yeah. And I've learned that, you know, the problem that I'm trying to solve today, uh, maybe with a couple executives, I could probably wait three, four weeks, just give them a, like a, you know, hey, let's talk about this. Why don't you think about this and let's meet in three or four weeks versus the old Sean will be, like, hey, can we solve this problem right now? Yeah. And they haven't had a chance. They're doing their thing. So very selfish of me uh, to do it that way. And so I've had to learn that uh, many times uh, because I am, I get a bit rammy uh, around the business decision, you know, type stuff. Now, Sean, I don't have like the full screen, so I don't know if you have a crystal ball in the background or anything that you, that you pull out or maybe one right in front of you, but do you have one? And what does it say about what the future holds? Uh, for what? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Well, let's just say for, 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 the, for the business uh, sector that Y Prime is involved with. So I, first off, it's never been more exciting time for us at, at Y Prime um, with the challenges that the industry faces. Like I said, with the core the core technology that we have that helps clients handle the meat and potatoes, adding in those convenience um, pieces of technology is fun because it, we get to interact with patients and sites more and we're going to be able to learn new things. So that intellectual curiosity that I've had since I was a kid, uh, it, it gets to be, it gets to come out and play a lot more. Um, so it's a big challenge we need to solve, but I think, 
you know, with the other big players that are starting to get into the market adjacently, like your Google, uh, Apple, I mean, Amazon has gotten into the, yeah. the prescription drug space. So those things are going to force us uh, to make some decisions and make some adjustments to stay competitive. Um, and so I'm excited that we're, we're well positioned. We have a lot of work still to do, just like everybody else. Um, and I really love this industry because I, I, there are countless people at Y Prime that are on prescription medicines that we worked on. And, yeah. And, including my children. So I, I, I feel like it's a great industry to be in, very rewarding uh, and happy to be part of this team. So final question relates to um, uh, reading and if you've had a chance to read any books and anything that you may recommend to the listeners or anything you recommend that we avoid. The one thing I had missed for, since the pandemic is audiobooks because yeah. I used to listen to and from the office. Um, if I wasn't on a conference call, I was listening to an audiobook, and I haven't done that <laughs> yeah. at all uh, working from home. And, uh, you know, I think there was a couple that selfishly I really liked. The Hard Thing About Hard Things um, was a book of, about uh, Mark Andreessen. Um, or, uh, no, it was Ben Horowitz. Yeah. Uh, from uh, Andreessen and Horowitz. Uh, he wrote the book and he had a lot of CEO experiences that you could say, uh, you could kind of get in the self pity mode. Oh yeah, me too. I have that challenge. And there was another one that I loved. Um, I think it was called the billion dollar coach. It was okay. uh, Bill, Bill Campbell was a board member for like Google, Apple, you know, all these big tech companies that, you know, um, and prior to that, he was like a football coach. And his famous line to the CEOs was, don't F that, you know, don't F it up. You know, you've got yeah. to work. And I think you have to kind of have that mentality sometimes when you're running a team or a mid to large company is like, hey, the CEO could mess things up. Um, so you really have to be thoughtful about how you communicate. Um, there's a there's countless ones. I like uh, Rework is an old one. Yeah. Uh, my favorite sales book ever was, um, I think it was, uh, don't, don't teach a kid to ride a bike at a conference or something okay. like that. That's a good one. That was really, and that one, that one actually touched on a lot about what you talked about, um, communication styles yeah. and, and really understanding how humans, um, no, I think it's, you can't teach a kid to ride a bike at a conference or, or Something like that. No, I'll, I'll, we'll, I'll look it up before we, uh, before we publish this one. But it's good, and it's good. That's how you remembered it too. Um, the, 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 the hard thing about hard things is the, is the, the most recommended book on the Health Biz podcast. It seems to be uh, popular among those that I have. Uh, well, you know what with. it is. I think if, if you're talking to executives, it's a quick read. Yeah. I mean, and each chapter is a, basically a podcast. Right. It could be. I mean, I wouldn't be surprised, David, if you could write a book with all the different stories yeah. that you've heard. Yeah, well. And little bite-sized chunks just like uh, Ben did. That's probably doable. Yeah, we'll see if anybody would read it. That is a good book, though. Those are just some heady times when he was uh, making those decisions and, and living through that. So, well, great. Well, Sean Blackburn, co-founder and CEO of Y Prime, I want to say thank you for being my guest today on the Health Biz Podcast. Thanks, David. Thanks for, thank you for having me. This was a lot of fun. You've been listening to the Health Biz Podcast with me, David Williams, president of Health Business Group. I conduct in-depth interviews with leaders in healthcare business and policy. If you like what you hear, go ahead and subscribe on your favorite service. While you're at it, go ahead and subscribe on your second and third favorite services as well. There's more good stuff to come, and you won't want to miss an episode. If your organization is seeking strategy consulting services in healthcare, check out our website, healthbusinessgroup.com.